Welcome to the Humanity Dialogues. I am Molly Brunson, Associate Professor of Slavic Languages and Literatures and History of Art at Yale University. And today I'm welcoming you as Faculty Director of the Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies Program at the Macmillan Center for in International and Area Studies at Yale. The Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies Program has sponsored this event. The Humanity Dialogues has been organized as a response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. It's a conversation to reflect on contingency as existence and the critical intertwining of art and politics within societies at war. Today, we're offering the fourth conversation in our series. And I'd ask that you please follow the link in the chat to subscribe to our mailing list so that you're notified of future events, one of which will take place this Friday. The title for today's conversation is Rapid Response, Solidarity of Artists in the Time of War. And I say with confidence that today's topic is one that the whole world has been stunned by. The immediate, powerful, and often quite moving transformation of average citizens, uh, but also in this case, the artistic sphere into aid workers and solidarity networks, leveraging these communities to provide relief and support and exposure to those in need. So we're very lucky to have as our guests today four cultural leaders to discuss this question. I will introduce them in turn. Asha Tsitsar is a Ukrainian culture, uh, curator and anthropologist living and working in Warsaw. Tsitsar is the curator of the Secondary Archive, a platform for women artists from throughout Central and Eastern Europe, Ukraine, and Belarus. Olga Kapienkina is a Belarus-born independent curator and art critic. She worked as the curator of the gallery Six Line in Minsk, Belarus from 1993 to 1998, and now lives in New York City and teaches at NYU and Fordham University. Yulia Krivich is a Ukrainian artist and a member of Zagrupa, an expatriate artist group living in Poland. Krivich lives in Warsaw and works at the Academy of Arts in the Photography and Post-Artistic Activities Studio. She is a co-founder of the Sunflower Solidarity House of Culture. Kupa Schroeder is a researcher, independent curator, and a lecturer at the Academy of Fine Arts in Warsaw. His most recent book, The ABC of the Projectariat, Living and Working in a Precarious Art World, was published in December of last year. Our conversation today will be co-moderated by Marta Kuzma and Marianne Hirsch. Marta is a professor of art and the former dean of the Yale School of Art. She spent the 1990s in Kyiv founding and directing the Soros Center for Contemporary Art. Marianne te Mariana teaches comparative literature and gender studies at Columbia University. She writes about the transmission of memories of violence across generations, combining feminist theory with memory studies in a global perspective. Please join me in welcoming our guest today. Uh, before I turn it over to Marta and Mariana, I will also say that you may post your questions within the Q&A at any point during today's presentations, and we will get to as many as possible uh, towards the end of our time together. Thanks so much. Thank you, Molly. Um, and here we are uh, in our, this is now our fourth uh, uh, dialogue uh, in this series, and the intent of the series is intended to hear and to allow those who are experiencing the war from within Ukraine to speak directly. So we're here primarily to listen and also to hear from those who are in some way impacted by the war, uh, if even outside of the borders of Ukraine. And we place these individuals in conversation with others who have either written or taught on issues of tyranny, war, and violence. So today, uh, we are here to listen to um, those who have so kindly and generously made themselves available in finding out more about how their roles as artists have shifted into those of humanitarian and aid workers, essentially, and also into individuals who are those who are establishing networks of solidarity so that a community of artists is sustained both from within Ukraine and outside the confines of Ukraine. Yulia, Asia, Olga, and Kuba, thank you for joining us today. 
And I'm also grateful to you, Mariana, for joining our discussion today as someone who has written profoundly and extensively on post memory uh, and on how violent histories are transmitted across generations and how, according to a very important recent text, you have written, um, you have written about, quote, inherited histories of rootedness and violent uprooting and how they, they leave their marks on our bodies and our souls. This we are in, indeed seeing in, a, in an, an amazingly horrible uh, migration of individuals, forced migration of individuals who, um, who heard about this kind of uprooting perhaps from their parents and from their grandparents. And so we are looking at a post-post-Soviet generation that has entered into this experience. When Kuba and I had spoken yesterday, he made me very well aware of some important points that I think are important to bring to, to light in this conversation. That the city of Warsaw, of which uh, three of our speakers are, uh, are residing in today, is a city of 1.4 million residents. It has recently absorbed 300,000 Ukrainians who are fleeing from war. In, reviews, in reviewing today's UNICEF accounting, there are 10 million Ukrainians who have been displaced by war um, and that they have either left the country or stayed within the country since uh, February 24th. And since February 24th, there has been a migration or refugees in the amount of 3,557,000 people of which 2.1 million have located to Poland. Now, the reasons of them staying in Poland are assorted, but of course, Kuba had mentioned and emphasized that many of the families that they have met are those that intend to return back, and that actually 400,000 individuals have returned back into Ukraine uh, to, 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 to fight um, the, the war or to be reconvened with their families. Um, of the remaining 6.5 million of that 10 million displaced are those who have left their homes within Ukraine and 40% of that 6.5 million are located in Western Ukraine. So you can see the dramatic shifts of population that have happened within the last four weeks, three to four weeks. Um, with that, I know that Asia and Yulia, you have been very active as artists in your own right in incorporating political concepts in your work. And suddenly you have been in Warsaw for some years, both of you, but please explain how this role has shifted in the recent weeks and also to let us know more about the Sunflower Project that you are involved yeah, in. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us and give us a voice right now it's uh, it's very important for us uh yeah i will start with um, my presentation of sunflower center with a video uh which i want to share oh sorry with uh i forgot the to share with the uh with the sound yes Пожалуйста. Как усугублять Пожалуйста, ситуацию? не будем усугублять ситуацию. Наш Ребята. с вами разговор ни к чему не Ребята, приведет. Ребята, положите в карманы Ничего семечки. Не решит. Наш с вами разговор. Я поняла, положите семечки Хорошо. или семена цветов. Я... Вы здесь семенами я... ляжете. Сделаю. Вы да, пришли на, на мою землю. Хорошо, я вас слышу. Вы понимаете? Вас слышу. Вы оккупанты. Хорошо. Вы враги. Да. И вы уже с этой секунды прокляты. Да. Я вам отвечаю. Все. Теперь послушайте меня. Я вас услышала. Не будем усугублять ситуацию, храните. А куда уже усугублять? Вы, вы пришли, блядь, непрошенные Хорошо. твари, конченые. Um, 
Yeah, this is a, do you hear it? There, there was a sound, right? Okay. Uh, so yeah, I wanted to start this, um, the story about the, the, the story of this brave woman and where um, the sunflower, the sunflower is a, one of the symbol of Ukraine and one of the symbol for us and renewal right now. Um, there, for example, there are a lot of sunflowers uh, fields uh, on my region, in my region Dnipro. It's the eastern central part of Ukraine. And uh, sunflower in this case, I mean, in the case which uh, this woman like gave him the seeds, it's also the, I think the symbol of such an and a meaning in a meaningless situation, which it is a war. And uh, war, for, um, on my opinion, it never has a, a meaning, a sense at all. So yeah, we, I'm a Yulia Krivich, I'm an artist and also I'm an activist and uh, we work in Museum of Modern Arts in Warsaw. Uh, we, uh, there's a group of people actually, we're Ukrainians, uh, we are from Belarus, from Poland, uh, and we all, we all work in a solidarity center which calls Sunflower. Uh, and now I will show you some pictures of it. Um. Yeah. So, um, uh, we are born in Ukraine, but last uh, few years we're living in Warsaw and um, I will start the, my story and our story with the, with the third day of the war. Uh, I remember the day that evening we gathered uh, in a museum of modern art uh, to make a banners uh, to go to the protest manifestation to the Russian embassy in Warsaw. And uh, I remember that evening very well. We were still in shock and uh, uh, there are a lot of people came to museum to help us. And it was a huge, I mean, back then, um, the most terrifying feeling that we had, that we were alone, we, we, will be, we will be alone in this situation, and no one defend us except we are. And uh, in that day, I understood there a lot of help coming from different parts of the world and country in Poland. And I, I felt a lot of support of the people, real people, uh, not politician, but real people. Uh, so um, since then we started a Sunflower Solidarity Community Center in the museum offices building at the Panska Street. So um, Sunflower, uh, it's an um, emergency support initiative during the first days of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And thanks to their ideas, engagement of artists, of volunteers, of uh, activists from Poland, Ukraine, and Belarus. Uh, for example, it's a Bliskis Collective, uh, Mi, Asha, Kaya Kustra, Bonch Foundation, Veronika Wysocka, and many other volunteers who came and still come and uh, help us. So together with the team, also with the team of museum, uh, we turned their museum offices to the, and to, to the help center for migrants and refugees. From the very beginning, our activities uh, have focused on the first aid and you see here on my picture, there are like, we're making, we made sandwiches. Uh, so we're preparing uh, meals, collecting medicines and at the same time, Sunflower is a common space uh, open for both those quick response actions, but also long-term in initiatives. And uh, during those, uh, during the, the three uh, weeks uh, of our activities, uh, we prepared, yeah, we prepared uh, uh, 300,000 uh, sandwiches distributed to Warsaw's railway station, but the, and also the points of uh, different points where refugees come. Uh, and uh, organized transports of medicines and medical equipments uh, uh, directly to Ukraine, to Chernobyl. Uh, uh, we delivered thousands of hot meals to the refugee crisis center. We collected money and aid and uh, collectively uh, we reached Ukrainian poetry, organized 
meetings, discussions, um, classes, workshops for children. Uh, together we learn Ukrainian and Polish language. Uh, we organize also workshops for children and educational um, educational activities, meetings with artists and uh, activists, and also explore, of course, Ukrainian culture and art, which is very important right now. And uh, well, and Sunflower is a home to international think tank that research contemporary geopolitics from the perspective of Eastern Europe. Uh, together, we will we wait for a better better times and support each other and um, the museum and our this is museum and our respond to the question of the role of art institution in the time of war yeah thank you Yulia. is this being support how is this being supported but uh, by uh, donations by donations of uh, regular people like and what is your relationship with the Museum of Modern Art? How is the Museum of Modern uh, Art? Now I started work in the in the center, uh, in Sunflower Center, but the last three weeks it was like volunteer work for me because I just had to do something, had to do that I did. So uh, right now I, I, I have a contract and will work like a, a half time in the museum. Yeah. Thank you. and and. Uh, as I understand it, Yulia and Asya, you work together or you have been working on this project together? Perhaps if you may speak to that a bit more, uh, Asya. Actually, you know, Sun, Sun, Sunflower House of Culture is like very open form. I mean, like uh, literally everyone can came, can come there and start mm -hmm. to work or help. And <clears throat> more or less, this is how the this is how it works. I mean, like there are a lot of people, uh, as you mentioned, there are a lot of people from Ukraine, a lot of ultra, also um, artists, cultural workers uh, are coming to Warsaw. Maybe they are staying in Warsaw or they're moving farther, but anyway, this is also a place for them to, to get some help to, if they want to uh, organize some kind of project or if they need any kind of help, they can get it there. Um, um, also, the, the um, Sunflower uh, House of Culture also are organized uh, or was, was a part of our organization of the um, very kind of huge forum for uh, Polish arts uh, managers like community uh, to, um, to search for the ways how to help and uh, to um, start to work in, in, in different directions of, of help that we can probably, you know, organize for the people who are coming or for the people who are in Ukraine. So um, there were like four uh, directions of this work. First is uh, um, any kind of cultural events to support um, to support protests or to support uh, you know to keep this this terrible situation more visible and uh, maybe you know some kind of creative pro protest also helps to survive in this situation. I mean, like this is some kind of um, mental reveal. Uh, also, <clears throat> another uh, direction is uh, uh, um, to organize some uh, resources of the art community in Warsaw and in Poland in general to help artists and cultural workers who are coming. They're organizing residencies, they're coordinating, you know, um, the, um, they're trying to help uh, in, on, on the very basic level, they're trying to help to people who came. Um, another uh, branch is the um, another branch is the uh, cultural cultural propaganda center that uh, that uh, um, aims to um, you know to sh to speak about uh, the 
uh, about this war uh, in the words which are um, uh, which are which which seems to us more let's say proper and fair because uh, this is a huge topic I, I don't want to touch it like uh, very deeply, but um, in general, this is the the office or this is the idea how to uh, how to counteract in the world of you know Russian propaganda and West explaining and somewhere in the middle you have Ukraine and probably and also other countries around Ukraine who suffered not from war right now, but they're also involved in this war and they are also suffering from from the consequences of this situation how to reveal the the, the, the truth from these regions and from these societies and uh, maybe i don't i don't think that we have a lot of time now but the the, the last thing maybe that i wanted to mention is that um we are also working on um let's say um we're trying to develop some kind of um uh, ethical, um, I don't know, rules, maybe this, I, I'm, this would be not the best word, but uh, we're trying to develop some ethical system, how to speak about this situation. And um, mm, this is also a huge topic, but one of the most important thing that we realize now is that we need to speak, uh, maybe this would be the banal thing, but, um, we are asking people not to speak about Ukraine without Ukrainians because like during a lot of a lot of years we were in the situation where uh, these the, 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 the this country and its culture and its history were just you know an object of the discussions of others and uh, what really happened and like it was discussed by people who never were in Ukraine or had not now written no relationships and no uh, connection to this country. So, um, yeah. Asia, may, may I ask a question? When you speak about we, do you have some kind of sub-organized group and this activity of the, the are you, are, I, I take it you're speaking about another group or an organization or a collective from which you're I, working? When I'm, when I'm telling the word we, this means, you know, uh, everyone who are willing to work and help <laughs> and uh, I think like everyone who is, uh, there are a lot of people who are willing to help. Uh, and uh, if someone is coming with the very, very concrete project or idea, this like has all, uh, all uh, chances to be realized and implemented in reality and, uh, and work, for example. Uh, for example, we are starting the um, the um, series of the lectures uh, when we are discussing about the um, cultural heritage of the uh, cities in Ukraine, which uh, were vanished or bombed the most. And this is about Mariupol, this is about Kharkiv, this is also about Bucha and Irpin and uh, mono, so-called mono cities of Donbass. Uh, you know, the small cities around between Donetsk and Luhansk, most of them, most of the cities doesn't exist anymore because they were just simply vanished. And yeah, and like there could be a lot of examples of... of uh, and are, are you in contact with individuals and artists within the country and how does that function? The, 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 we are trying... The we, for example, for this series of lecture, we are uh, inviting uh, researchers and curators from Ukraine to to make those lectures because, like, they worked on these uh, during last eight years. You know, this is the direct answer of the question: What have you? What were you doing during the last eight years? We actually did a lot. Uh, and uh, this is very sad, but very good occasion to present these in insane, uh, you know, work that was done during these times. And the, the whole, uh, you know, all those, uh, um, all those um, 
articles, art projects, festivals, books, um, everything. Uh, yeah, this is like the, the the possibility for us also to present what was done. Uh, and also we are cooperating, um, as I mentioned, for example, in this forum, there were uh, a couple of people who managed uh, a couple of uh, workers of uh, Pinchu Park Center and Jam uh, Factory in Lviv uh, who managed to escape and who managed to speak with us uh, during this forum. Also, there are people like not very, uh, maybe not so very known uh, cultural actors of, of Ukrainian culture, but still uh, they are coming to this um, center and like helping. But the problem with cooperation with the Ukrainian com art community now is that, you know, all people are reacting differently to this situation. And I think that we like, this is so normal to react differently because people are different and uh, someone is uh, living uh, someone is still in Ukraine for example someone are artists but they turn their workshops to the shelters or they turn their workshops to and uh, starting to produce something very useful for the army or they are just simply you know uh, on the residency somewhere abroad and they just want everyone to leave them alone and give them some space and time just to breathe in and breathe out. And someone is willing to fight on the cultural front or on the battlefield. Uh, so like people are reacting very differently. People are in very different mental condition and physical condition and uh, everyone is like, this is very true that everyone is willing to work with Ukraine now, but each time when um, someone is trying to do it, I mean, like we as Ukrainians very appreciate it and all people in Ukraine very appreciate it, but uh, just um, like be, be patient to us because we all are now going through very hard times and now, not every one of us has the luxury to, you know, to be somewhere in the more, more or less safe places. So, yeah. Thank you, Asha. Um, I, on that, that point, uh, you know, we have Olga Kopenkin, uh, Kopenkin, Kopenkina here, sorry, Olga. And you have been outside of the Belarus for some years, since 1999, and you have been actively working as a curator, but still working and embedding the topics of opposition within your curatorial practice. And recently um, you had uh, worked and have been working on the gatherings of the assembly every week together with Dmitry Velensky, who is an artist based in St. Petersburg and perhaps could be termed an oppositional artist within Russia. Uh, and that has been together with uh, 16 Beaver, uh, with uh, uh, Irene Anastas and Rene Gabri. If you can speak a bit about how you have been working outside of the borders of these uh, confined situations, both as a curator and activist. You're muted. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Marta and Kuba, for inviting me uh, to this discussion. Yes, I left uh, Belarus in 1999, um, and I was a curator there, and uh, I continue my curatorial career here. Uh, it's my profession. Uh, uh, but you know it's very hard uh, to uh, to talk about uh, curating right now, right? So it's very hard actually to um, uh, project any uh, professional skills and values of uh, you know making exhibitions to the situation in which we are now, because uh, curating as an um, exhibitions is possible only in the situation of norm no uh, normality. So it's kind of like it's a normal 
uh, practice, right? So that uh, in the state of emergency, uh, it's very hard to, you know, talk even talk about exhibitions that we have curated as oppositional as they were. Um, uh, I did curate a, a project um, uh, dedicated to the Belarusian protest in 2011 actually. So when there was a political crisis in Belarus and um, when um, after the elections, uh, uh, rigged ele elections, when a lot of pe people, political opponents and protesters were prosecuted. Um, and uh, I organized a show with Belarusian artists here in New York City. Um, yeah, but now in the, in the situation of war, you know, uh, it's a situation of emergency, and it's not, not only in Ukraine. It's uh, it's everywhere, especially for those who Eastern Europeans who live abroad. Um, uh, we, I feel that I'm I'm in the situation of emergency right now. So uh, also because the art in Ukraine, uh, I mean, speaking about museums and theaters and galleries, um, right now they are turned into the bomb shelters, and museums are desperately trying to save their heritage, right? Um, and so it's very hard to think about art as anything than object to be saved and object to be protected. Um, but of course, outside outside of Ukraine, now uh, we uh, cultural practitioners we can mobilize and we can use all possible means, uh, you know, to respond to the situations. Uh, for example, if uh, to respond to this war, sorry, I should learn how to not to use any uh, any other words except the war. Uh, so, for example, um, last week I attended the uh, action. Uh, or, uh, or performance uh, in front of the Russian embassy here in New York City, uh, which was organized by the Seagull Theater from CUNY Graduate Center. Um, it was a um, reenactment of uh, Tanya Bruguera's uh, performance Tatlin's Whispers, if you know if you know what I'm talking about. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any slide presentations, so it was, um, I, I didn't prepare slides, but, uh, I'm sure that many, many of you know this uh, performance, um, and uh, it was not organized by Tanya, so Tanya wasn't even there. Uh, it was organized by this uh, theater, so they invited people, friends, and small group of people to read poems and um, uh, or text that they think can address the, this current moment uh, in front of a Russian embassy. Um, so. Yeah, so that was very moving uh, performance, very, very interesting, very good. Um, and, um, it, but I do want to talk about maybe one particular show um, that was uh, organized by the group of Belarusian curators um, uh, not so long ago in Ukraine. You know, as hard as it's, uh, you know, impossible to imagine anything like this, right? So, but it was in 2001, uh, a year ago, uh, the Kiev Art Center Mistetsky Arsenal hosted an exhibition every day, Art Solidarity and Resistance, uh, dedicated to the Belarusian protest, uh, which was violently suppressed by Lukashenko regime in 2020. Many artists who participated in the exhibition were prosecuted, and one, Alice Pushkin, is still in prison. Uh, Mistetsky Arsenal first approached curators in Belarus, but they declined the offer, worrying about their safety. Instead, they asked those artists and curators living abroad to step up and curate the show. The exhibition featured more than 80 artists who covered citizens' street activism during the protest between August and November in, um, in Belarus. Uh, spontaneous actions that took place there, um, uh, as well as uh, artist works made in, in the aftermath of the protest and su subsequent repressions. In a very short period of time, the exhibition was conceived in November 2020 and organized in the March 21, they opened in March 21. Um, practically the archive of resistance was created 
And one of the curators of this exhibition said that an exhibition is a form of care, right? So that was, she imagined, they imagined the exhibitions as a form of care. I'm, I'm talking about this because I wrote about this show. So I wrote quite an, an extensive review published uh, by After Image. Uh, so, and uh, I was particularly struck by uh, her uh, uh, reflect, um, definition of exhibition as a form of care. So care that didn't provide the immediate relief, but uh, somehow led to the creation of community with its horizontal structure, non-hierarchical non coalition between our system curators, because our system were curators in the show and they exhibited their work they works but they also exist and other other works and they didn't distinguish between works which were born on the streets you know like activism on the streets and um you know works that was produ produced by professional artists so that was quite an in interesting um, uh, experiment and uh, which i think laid ground for future collective actions and the exhibition was also a logical next step after the strike uh, because many artists actually declared the strike uh, in Belarus when there were protest, protests were going on. Um, because the timing of this exhibition was uh, as such as uh, when the protest had already faded away, right? And after that activism and uh, incredible heightened kind of production uh, and then it just rapidly went, faded away. So the goal of the exhibition was to preserve the energy of the protest, right? To kind of like take it on the, in another level and take it out of the country, outside to Ukraine, right? And now Ukraine is in ruins, right? So, and I was thinking that who's gonna, how we're gonna, where we're gonna take, you know, all these energies of this uh, resistance and the struggle. So where are we gonna bring it? Uh, it yeah, Olya, yeah, thank you. It's a, it's, a, it's a really good point to actually, because I know that Kuba, this is something that we discussed yesterday is how do you amplify exactly what Olga is speaking about? Like how do you amplify the voices? If you can't amplify, there's not any kind of curatorial per se activity going on during a war. And there's a lot of movement. People are moving around depending on, you know, this morning I spoke to an artist who was in Kiev and then migrated somewhere else because the shelling was so difficult. And then the shelling happened in another town. And it's just like this idea of a being, it's not like you go to another place in Ukraine and stay there. It's like, you have to move around. So. Kuba, if you can speak a bit more, because you were speaking about how do you amplify these voices that are still very active? I mean, it's, you know, people are, are, are thinking about things, even if they're workshops or some kind of attempt to create some kind of community or networking. Um, and, and what happens to these institutional structures that were there before? So maybe before I uh, respond to the question, thank you for, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for arranging this uh, series of uh, talks. Uh, I was here on the uh, last Friday and I was really astonished. And actually, I think that we were all scared by the perspective of uh, Chernobyl and uh, other uh, atomic plants being invaded by Russian militaries. But then uh, like maybe before I respond to this uh, uh, question, uh, let me uh, emphasize one thing. But we think about times of crisis as something very special, unique times of crisis, times of war, very particular, right? Uh, as something unique, and it is, of course, it's, uh, it is calamity, it is, uh, it is horrible, but then in this time of war, the networks that are, going, uh, that are activated are pre-existing. So I think lots of people, like uh, from what I uh, gathered in, um, uh, in various situations currently, so a lot of pre-existing uh, networks of, um, cultural exchange of like also just mutual ties between regular people. It's not only uh, related to the art scene. Like, so like there were about 1 million Ukrainians already in Poland before the war started. So a lot of this, um, and they were also like, um, 
you know, like, of course, this is not a milk and honey land, like Poland is not necessarily, a, 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 you know, very friendly uh, to uh, people who are doing menial uh, jobs. But then, on the other hand, lots of people just made friendships, they just became co-workers. And then in this time of war, I think a lot of people responded very in instinctively activating this uh, the solidarity networks in order to help uh, each other. I think well, we saw it uh, definitely in uh, the culture scene, like with Yulia, for example, we are working together already since years on different art activist uh, campaigns and projects as part for the, of the Consortium for Post-Artistic Practices. So, you know, if we think about it, like, for example, in the museum, it is typical, like uh, when, when Olga was talking about these exhibitions as care, the Museum of Modern Art, in fact, specializes in this type of understanding of art and culture as something which is related to the outside world, as something which is kind of socially useful or something that is uh, benefiting a kind of um, civic society. So in the, you know, in the time of war, this kind of situations just uh, prompted the solidarities very quickly emerge because, because of the ties, right? Weak ties, trust, this, uh, uh, and then solidarity. I think this is uh, super important. Because it's also like way of thinking uh, about the future, how this can be, how this kind of um, situations uh, can be uh, amended or something like that, so like where relief can uh, can happen. And so then, like another thing that is important maybe here is, um, and because of this, this rapid responses were very very rapid. So just a week after the uh, Russian invasion, we organized a summit of cultural workers and art workers from an artist uh, curators from Ukraine, Belarus, uh, from uh, Poland, from all over Poland, and uh, circa 100 people came just with two days notice, right? So because uh, people uh, know each other and they just kind of, they are kind of comrades, colleagues, friends, uh, and, uh, and they just respond to a call very, very quickly. And that's how also different platforms emerge. But maybe before I just uh, start to talk about conclusions of this uh, summit, let me just uh, say a couple of words about um, museums and artistic institutions, because uh, I would say that such initiatives, because we also have a tendency to think that crisis is a very special, exceptional, unique situation, and in a sense it is. But then on the other hand, because the Museum of Modern Art and other similar museums like uh, uh, Gazette in the European Coalition of Museums Internationale, they already made a lot of effort into transforming them into some kind of, kind of constituent museums or socially useful museums. In the time of wars, they start to function as institutions of the common. So there are certain structures, you know, like established, certain types of like, so for example, in the Museum of Modern Arts, there are already there are friends listening to us, like uh, Sebastian Cichotsky, Kuba Debczyński, Bogna uh, Stefańska. Uh, they have like a, a research department that actually uh, operates as this kind of interventionist office. So when the moment uh, of crisis happens, you know, like Julia, you were saying, like, so it's clear, like that then you uh, congregate in a museum, you make banners there, and then suddenly, you know, you end up producing 300,000 sandwiches, right? So this is because of the reforms and the because of the uh, changing of the understanding of what the museum is. And of course, it's based on contradictions, it's based on tensions, it's not an easy process, there are like uh, bureaucratic pressures, and there are also uh, the stereotypic understanding of them, what the museum is, that this social function uh, kind of uh, is not necessarily very kind of like, it's not easy, easy convergence, it's uh, rather a tension, but it's a productive one in this particular uh, situation. So then talking about amplification of uh, voices, one of the main conclusions of the summit was, and it was underlined, but all the, uh, all the speakers, especially from Ukraine, that this is as much a humanitarian crisis as a war effort. Mm -hmm. This is very important, you know, like when you think about polls, like now conducted in Ukraine, of course, like all the polling, you know, during the war is, uh, you know, whatever, you know, but then uh, it is, of course, a very problematic situation. But then there is a very, very high morale and like people believe that this war will be won, you know, like in Ukraine. And that's what they uh, what they want to do. They ask us to support this war effort. You know, they do not want to be just refugees or victims. You know, they are actually fighters who fight for the uh, right for democratic self-determination. And there are like certain repercussions of this change of perspective, right? On the one hand, we, and you already, Marta, said, because we talked about it yesterday as well, about this, it's also very gender-based dynamic, right? We have this uh, 10, million, 10, 10 million people displaced, mm -hmm. three and a half million people escaping from, the, uh, from uh, Ukraine. But from what I talk with, a lot of people host them here in Warsaw and so on. Uh, so then, you know, and, and I'm sure Yulia and Asha also, 
knows much more about that than I do. But then, you know, like a lot of people say that this is a temporary situation. These are women and uh, children who come over. They want to stay in a safe space, you know, but then they consider the, like, uh, the men are fighting. They also cannot leave the country. This is that's also very important. Um, it's of course a tragedy for a lot of trans people and for people who are like pacifists and they do not want to um, engulf in violence. This is also a tragedy for them. Like uh, this has to be said, like not to get into this very heroic, you know, bravado type of uh, situation. War is horrible. And then, but then, you know, uh, but then like so women are leaving the country and also staying. I think the kind of communitarian aspect of this is ultra important. You know, so when you have like a lot of residences uh, abroad, as Julia and Asha were saying, some people, of course, need it. It's, uh, and this is very important. But then lots of people also say, well, but there are like hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people staying in Ukraine. The friends, are artists, are curators, cultural workers who are in Ukraine and they need help just as much. And, you know, like we were talking with Oleg Radinsky, who was here uh, last Friday, and some of them, you know, like they just like they have this feats of writing you know so like then this these people need to these people need definitely platforms to publish talking coming to your initial question right amplifying these voices is ultra important providing platforms republishing there is also he said translating he said that there's a lot of stuff being published on social media there's a lot of stuff being published in ukrainian like there's this a tremendous amount of research that asha was emphasizing that you know that was has been done in the last years um, and currently it needs to be translated and uh, put on platforms that are actually, you know, providing outreach, for example, right, this is, uh, this is something that can happen. And then another maybe um, important stuff here, what Asha already said, so I will not maybe dwell too much on it, but if we think about this as a war effort, then we also think about propagation of the cost, right? That this cost needs to be propagated, the interest needs to be sustained. And the, there is like, as we all know, there is like tremendous amount of uh, Russian propaganda and also a lot of soft uh, power being uh, used in the last two decades. So a lot of discussions that we were encountering uh, was related to the fact that the, uh, some perspectives are definitely skewed against Ukraine or like that, you know, like the voices were silent, nobody was interested, you know, if we think about uh, the um, sheer amount of art washing that was conducted uh, in terms of uh, oligarchic money in the arts, in terms of like, you know, high profile uh, um, exhibitions um, being conducted that were, you know, between, for example, Berlin and Moscow and so on and so forth. It's, it's astonishing. So we need to consider that there is this huge disbalance of forces and like silence uh, and the Ukrainian voices and other regional uh, voices were silenced. So now it is important to amplify those, I think. Uh, and um, maybe just if, uh, on the finishing note, one thing that can be said here is that we need to, like Olga, was, what you were saying about this, um, that um, uh, art is something to be preserved, uh, as if it was uh, just something to be preserved. On the other hand, like if we think about this war, this war is a colonial war. This, is, this war is a war for like eradication of culture, eradication of uh, Ukrainians as a separate uh, group of people with their own unique culture, unique art, and so on. So when we talk about, with, when we talked with people, you know, it's like genocidal war in this sense. You know, like Ukrainians are considered just minor Russians uh, by uh, the Putinist uh, type of uh, totalitarian propaganda. They, they need to be re, uh, re russified as major Russians, right? Uh, uh, it's a, just a glitch in imperial Russian project. So this is a art and culture and language and memory are actually crucial factors in this struggle. They're not just some kind of side issue. It's actually a crucial thing, right? Of course, there are like uh, you know there are bombs, there are artilleries, and so on. But at the other, on the uh, at the bottom line, is actually a culture, and it is there is a right for uh, democratic self determination that is uh, at stake here of the huge nation, like uh, of uh, with its uh, unique history and unique uh, um, memory as well. And it's just very, very, very last note. Uh, it is also I think like when I was thinking about what is. Why do people in Poland respond so instinctively to, them, to this? Um, I think that precisely because of this post memory generated, like, and you know, like kind of that is uh, habitually absorbed in the bodies, you know, like of people. When we think now about Mariupol, you know, like everybody see Warsaw in 1994, you know, uh, 1944. 
And, you know, we were told from the very, like, uh, you know, when I was a kid, you know, we were told that never again, and yet it happens, you know, and the shock of this and the visceral, uh, like, gut type of uh, the feeling of this, you know, need to help and need to struggle. I think this is what explains mostly also, or like, this is one of the factors that explains uh, why there is such a instinctive um, Add to uh, to support Ukrainian cause at least in uh, in Poland, and I think this differs very much with the Western Europe in this uh, the lack of this uh, experience. Thank you, and sorry for taking so much time. So I'm I'm wondering in the solidarity networks that you're that you're building, but that you're also building on, what is the place of Russians who've escaped and who've been in the opposition and Russian artists and curators? and art workers, um, how are they involved? How have they been involved? And are they being received um, in Warsaw and other places? Uh, Olga, I was wondering whether you could mention a little bit about the assembly, because the assembly and then when you meet, because the, I, I was fortunate enough to attend uh, this cooperation between the assembly, Olga, and Dmitry Velensky and Rene Gabri and Irina Nastas. And there were artists from with you know from outside of Ukraine, those that were also in from Belarus, Rus, uh, activists, uh, cyber activists, and also oppositional artists from within Russia. Um, and uh, Olga, if you can speak a bit about that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I can say a couple of words so, uh, so that even before the war started, the um, uh, international network of friends and colleagues, so, um, yeah, it's international, it's, um, it's a network, as Kuba said, that these networks were already established before the war, right? So, and uh, they comprise of people from uh, all over the world. Also, uh, the, it, it's, uh, it's a network that came from the uh, former 16 Beaver, right? It's a group that uh, had a very precise location here in New York City. So it's a little bit New York centric, of course, because Rene and Irene uh, lived here. And I think that they are still part time living here. So, and it has a precise address, 16 Beaver in the um, financial district um, in Manhattan. So, and for many, many years, uh, people used to congregate in this uh, place. Um, and uh, many people came through this place. So, many people were aware of this place, especially Europeans who would come to New York City and they would always know that there is a place where that they have to attend in order to have a free discussion, discussions. So there was no exhibitions, there was no any uh, kind of art making or kind of, you know, regular institutional, you know, programming. So there was, it was a discussion space. There was a free kind of, uh, with very loose structure, let's put it that way. Only chairs and occasionally they did screening, film screenings. So, and uh, now all this network became, became online network and it's also expanded, right? Because it's much easier to expand it online. Um, it's not limited by the uh, physical space. And uh, yes, uh, we started organizing uh, this discussion uh, when Russians start amassing the troops on the border with Ukraine, uh, so we start. We decided to organize a series of discussions, but we struggle actually to pinpoint the subjects and formulate the topics, uh, you know, accurately, uh, because uh, it was not clear what's actually happening. Right, so some topics were formulated along the line of left critique of nation state, but also the rights of smaller nations and weaker nations to defend their sovereignty, but also in terms of global vulnerability of those who resist colonialism or co coloniality and imposition of the global order. Um, so we wanted to talk about Ukraine, but not only, we also wanted to talk about Belarus and Armenia and Palestine and so on. But the war started and we immediately ran into the bitter arguments with Ukrainian friends 
of the words and frameworks that we use. And we ended up having discussions focused on Ukraine and with um, a few Ukrainian friends, um, but it was very uneasy discussions. Uh, it was um, uh, discussions full of, um, let's say that was probably better defined um, as an agon agonistic space. You know, there was a lot of agony. It was a lot of polemics, a lot of um, uh, disagreements. Uh, let's put it this way. Um, yes, and it was a, uh, especially disagreements uh, were between Ukrainian and Russian artists because um, uh, Dmitry Velyansky, uh, a member of Stodialite group from St. Petersburg, participated. And, um, and um, yeah, I, I guess that it was not about what he was saying, it was mostly the presence of Russians. Russian in this discussion, this debate has actually made um, many Ukrainian friends uneasy, right? So that there, it's um, this war is gonna be uh, tough, you know, for the culture, for the relationships between Russian and Ukrainian on all levels, you know, in all fields. So we know now that proliferation of this open letters that is trying and trying to oppose the participation of Russian artists, scholars, you know, everyone in the conferences, in the film festivals, in uh, uh, exhibitions and discussions. Um, and this is something that we are going to deal with, you know, it's something that we, it's going to be, yeah. I mean, this rift between Russia and Ukraine is going to be for generations, for many generations ahead. From what I recall, Olga, thank you. Uh, from what I recall in those discussions is that there were very important actions taken by some of the artists that were speaking as to what they were doing in order to do some kind of transgression uh, in some kind of um, less apparent way in order so that they could transgress what was a very prohibitive environment right now in Russia. But I believe the response on some of the artists was like, well, that's, you have a country of 140 million people. And if you oppose this war, then what is the role of protest um, and, if you have 140 million people and 1,400 people that are coming out and are imprisoned, then that's the what you need to take in order to not protect Ukraine or Russia, but protect democratic society. And I think what I'm hearing from many of the discussions that we've had and of a generation of post-Maidan operative generation was when that revolution really happened in Ukraine and allowed for an, a, a, the rise of a very democratic open society, a generation of individuals that believe in those kind of values. And so in uh, Belarus, we had a series of cyber activists and hackers that are saying, we, we are actually fighting this war together in Ukraine because if this war doesn't if, if, if Ukraine is defeated, then the situation in Belarus it becomes a more oppositional structure as well. So it seemed as though it was the values of a, less about an ethnicity, but about the values of an open society that is being right. fought out here. But it's also, uh, yeah, you read that, uh, that uh, argument, that um, Ukrainian argument to Russians that there are so many of you, why don't you just do something? But it's, I mean, it's uh, it's a matter of organizing, you know. It's a matter of lack of um, organization on the grassroots level in Russia. So, and it's not just it doesn't work, you know, this way that okay, there are many of us and we can do something. Uh, it's not. So you, you really have to organize. You have to do it for over over the years. And now, as one of the Russian participants uh, said during our six hundred discussion that uh, yeah there are social movements in Russia, oppositional movements in Russia, and quite strong. But they unfortunately they are all very vertical and they based on the on the leadership. They're very kind of precise, uh, 
you know, leadership. So, and when these leaders are taken away and they're in prison, there is nobody else can take up the space. So the, the social movement start crumbling down. And this is what happened in Russia, unfortunately, after Alexei Navalny was imprisoned. And so they basically, they, they were left behind, had less. So, and now they're trying to, to go to, the, to take the streets, but it's a very, like easily they get, the, the protest gets suppressed and, uh, you know, and um, destroyed. Uh, it's, it's, it's just very, very difficult right now in Russia as well, you know, because Russians have lived under the continuous oppression, you know, for, for so many years, you know, with this regime and Belarus as well. Belarus, in Belarus too. And what Yuliana Shemetavets was uh, proposing is to uh, organize the underground, right? Because the cyber party is basically an underground movement. So, and um, yeah, and here's the hope. Here's definitely the hope. But I don't know how much you can do on the, you know, in underground. It's, um, I, I, I just, I, I, you know, we can only hope you know, that it's possible to, to undermine the regime by, by working on the ground. But I think that now in this, um, in this time, it's very important to also to have a strong, robust civil society that can act. And, you know, unfortunately in Russia, it's in shambles. Thank you, Olga. I, I actually have a question since, you know, Mariana, for example. Uh, Asha had her hand up. Asha wanted to interview. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, sorry. If I may, you know, jump in. I just wanted to underline that um, um, I like see the point in, uh, in what uh, Olga just said, but um, at the same time, uh, we are. <clears throat> Um, we see what is going on, for example, in Belarus today. This is the 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 you know the renaissance of the partisan movement and the renaissance of the of of the even the word partisan because like um, uh, just a brief explanation like partisan was the main word for uh, Belarus uh, people to fight during the Second World War. Then partisan was the name uh, to uh, was the title of the whole strategy of this how Belarusian arts survived after 90s like they, they uh, appropriate this strategy and now we are seeing like um, you know people get back reappropriate this strategy and they're like uh, destroying the railways they are uh, fighting as partisans to help in some way in this war. And this is something which is not organized at all. I mean, like this is the pure will of those people to help and to just the ordinary people. And uh, just continuing uh, the, the, the conversation about Russia, of course, there is the whole movement called Boycott Russia, and maybe you will dedicate the, you know, the separate seminar to this. I will not speak about it now. But uh, what I think is important to mention is that the um, why it is so um, it is so um, painful for Ukrainians now to speak with people from Russia is not because they are Russians, it's not because of their ethnicity. This is because the spectrum of what is called uh, the, you know, the opposition, what is called uh, say not to the war is very wide. I mean, like during last eight years, <laughs> we were facing very liberal, very leftist artists who on the common exhibition was ask, were asking us as curators or Ukrainian artists, like, do you really want, uh, do you really feel that all Russians need to apologize for Crimea? And this was the direct question asked to, to us, like how, how we want to, how, how do you, what, what, what response could be to this question? <laughs> of course. And uh, I mean, like, 
I feel I don't I, I treat Russia as an independent sovereign country, which is not related to my country, to Ukraine. But what I feel as, as the viewer from, from the outside is that the whole system of Russian culture need to be changed. And it need to be changed from the very deep by the local, by the Russian cultural actors. And this is their responsibility. Uh, that they need to take to ca take care about their culture, about the whole system, because the culture actually shapes all system around, all, all politics system, all society. And this is something that was proved by Ukraine. This is something that was proved by Belarus after the, the, the last president elections. So, <clears throat> yeah. Well, thank you for this context. I think it's really important. I mean, my question was more about Russians who had escaped from, you know, there's over almost a half a million Russian, mainly intellectual and cultural workers, I think, who have left, journalists uh, who left in the last two weeks. Um, so, um, you know, I, I was sort of curious about whether networks of solidarity that have built had any, you know, had any of these connections, but your context is really important. And I, I guess I wanted to follow up on an earlier comment you made, Asha, which is about shifting the discourse and creative protests um, that the Sunflower Project is involved in. So I was really curious about some examples of creative protests, because it seems to me that's one thing that artists can do, which is to kind of even in the space in the midst of war, um, create some space for thinking differently and for looking differently and for being differently rather than responding in this kind of, you know, with military strategies, which is what we see in the news. I think uh, like Kuba and Yula can more ex uh, to, uh, explain of, of what was done during the last weekend and what will be done during the next weekend. But like the main focus of, of the activity in Warsaw, of the art activity in Warsaw is Russian embassy, you know. Uh, I just maybe want to add that, um, um, uh, that um, like we all now accepting a lot of, uh, a lot of different uh, uh, proposals and like ideas of the exhibitions and the project with, that we can make. And uh, uh, me personally, I like I answer it only to one. Uh, and uh, the the I still don't know what it will be, and I still don't uh, like I I, I cannot tell when and when and what it will be and where, but um, uh, we, uh, we, I mean, this is something that was uh, proposed to me, but like the first answer, the first very intuitive answer was, uh, I cannot make the exhibition by my own because like alone, like, like in one curator, because this is gonna be useless in this situation. And uh, also, so it's, it should be the collective and the collective of people who are simultaneously artists and curators. And the second important thing is that the process in this situation is much more important than the result. Mostly because all physical things that we can show are useless now as, as, uh, as uh, I guess, uh, Kuba or Olga mentioned, because like we are in the situation when we lost everything that we had, we only have our brains, our like bodies and, and what we feel and what we think. And this is the most powerful and useful thing that, that, that we have, that we as Ukrainian society have now. And this is something that we can work with. Thank you. Kuba, you were, thank you very much, Asya. Kuba, you were, um, had a it comment. Just, uh, more like also uh, to uh, respond to Mariana's pre previous uh, uh, question. Like also still, I mean, I, I will follow up with uh, Asha's, but maybe actually I will ask uh, Yulia to follow up with Asha, but I will so, show maybe a couple of slides from the last uh, Sunday. So you can uh, 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 tell about the action that uh, you actually did with Michal Friedrich. Uh, but then, uh, uh, 
I think this is actually fascinating when you ask about Russian artists, they do not come to Warsaw, you know, they, if they go, because it's also another thing, you know, that we have a very mm -hmm. specific regional history. I was thinking about it, like in terms of this uh, cultural, cultural diplomacy or this type of art contacts, Warsaw was always, uh, how to say it? not on the radar of, uh, to say the least, of the uh, Russian curators and major initiatives. It was more like, you know, going to Berlin, to Paris, to London, and that's where uh, the bridges were created. We were more working actually with Ukrainian friends and colleagues, you know, and, and comrades. And this uh, uh, solidarity networks, I think they also kind of emerge in this, in this situation. So like the specificity of the Central Eastern Europe somehow is here uh, related, you know, this kind of like, weird bloodlands between Russia and Germany, you know, like in which uh, in which uh, we're kind of like under this uh, cultural bridge. So I think that uh, I haven't heard about many uh, Russian uh, um, people who would uh, like to come here, though I've heard from people from St. Petersburg who would like to move, for example, to um, uh, to Baltic republics because this is so close. But otherwise, I think uh, I'm sure like, I've heard also from Turkish uh, friends that like a lot and lot of people are coming to Turkey now. Mm -hmm. uh, but but we are mm -hmm. not on this map of this migration, right? Uh, just to respond to your uh, to your question, yeah. uh, and then maybe I'll show the slides. Maybe Yulia, you would like to maybe you would like to say a couple of words about this um, the monoplasticist demonstration that we did uh, last uh, Sunday, uh, because Yulia was an initiator, so I think she's much better. No, no, no. I, actually, I was not. It was Michal who initiated the, the whole ah. the whole event. So, if you have some slides, please show us. I just want to add something about the art in this context. For example, for me, I was just I want to share some like experience which I felt in the beginning, like in the first two weeks. Uh, me as an artist, it was very hard to even think in the context of art because. Uh, I think even now, I think that uh, the art, the, all our like activities in our art scene uh, should be uh, direct to the, to the collecting, to collecting money to help directly to, to Ukraine. And I think this is uh, uh, the thing that is uh, the most important right now. And even then, in, on, it was on Sunday, um, uh, we, we make this uh, neoplasticist manifestation, right? Um, in, the, in the beginning, I also was like, is it make sense right now? Should we do this? Uh, but it was, for me, it was some kind of relief um, after those weeks of, you know, very stressful weeks. I mean, you you wake wake up every morning and uh, first thought that it, it is a war and your family is there and you check in the telegram and uh, alert, rate alert where it is. So <clears throat> I'm not sure that uh, right now I can explain, explain much about this manifestation. I mean, uh, it was initiated by Michal Friedrich and um, it was um, like completely um, like, Kuba, maybe you can like continue. <laughs> the yeah, I mean, uh, this was uh, this was uh, initiated as this uh, post artistic um, yeah. action demonstration of uh, paintings. I think like the one of the motifs here, of course, is this neoplasticist uh, forms, uh, but also a bit of suprema suprematist forms. But in a sense, it's a kind of like a bit much more constructivist in the spirit. And then, um, and uh, this um, this recombines uh, and uh, recalibrates uh, this uh, flag colors of Ukraine and uh, of Poland and of uh, also um, especially of these uh, two countries. And I think it was like a, the manifestation of um, of recomposition of of, uh, of this uh, kind of uh, polities that, that happens currently. I think also some people said that. Oh, that's how I would imagine like a victory parade after Ukraine wins this war. But you have this kind of like flags which are completely recomposed or like you, you can see them as flags, but of course you can also see them as paintings and a demonstration of uh, paintings. Of course, there is something obscene uh, making with this kind of uh, demonstrations in the times in the time of war, like uh, like um, Yulia said and uh, Asha said, and but this was a collective effort, I think. A, mm -hmm. um, 
aimed at uh, signaling a solidarity or some sort of like uh, also providing space for uh, imagination and a relief i think of the mm -hmm. from the kind of this daily toil and a daily um, struggle but of course this is something that can be made but then you know also Niki, nikita kadan was doing uh, exhibitions in the bunkers you know so this is also like it's important to also remember that this is not something that you know like only only people who like have a lot of free time and they like relative peace can do you know i think that sometimes people who are actually under the extreme duress also uh, do a lot of this kind of uh, uh, effort of course not to romanticize it with the situation at all because uh, just maybe here's the, the last uh, the last image actually julia is uh, here um, front and center um yes yeah, so maybe i'll just uh, okay, thank you i i believe we are at um we unfortunately need to close the session, but I, I, I really thank you for your efforts, for your activities, for your generosity in wanting to support others and in your collective efforts uh, in this very important time. Uh, we have also spoken with Cuba about the need to centralize information because we are all getting information about residencies, homes, help, uh, and that within the field of contemporary art and culture, individuals that really want to help other artists. And I'm hoping that we find a way to be able to, to gather that information to have um, to share with um, artists who are currently really trapped within Ukraine um, and in grave danger, in really grave danger. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mariana. Um, I hope we can hear more about your course, uh, which you are leading together with Susan Mizellis and Laura Wexler. Uh, and um, I believe we should dedicate a session to that as well and how that has changed within this um, sudden imposition of a mass war that's going on right now. Uh, Thank you. These sessions will be recorded. And there were many uh, uh, references to former sessions that we had, which are also available and recorded. Yuliana Shematovitz, who is part of the Cyber Partisans, who had been in uh, uh, discussion with Scott Shapiro, Vasil Chedepanen, uh, who uh, was a uh, very central part of the Kiev Biennial and uh, Visual Culture Center in Kiev in discussion with Tim Snyder. And also uh, last week, a very chilling and uh, disturbing uh, session and uh, dialogue with Professor Kate Brown and Svetlana Matvienko and Alexei Rudinsky. Um, these are all um, uh, um, recorded. And on Friday, we have a session at 2 p.m., exactly on the point that Kuba mentioned before, which is the art market, moving assets, and uh, financing the war and oligarchical structures of this. And that will be at 2 p.m. on Friday. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Molly. Thank you, Christina. And join us again. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Uh, be safe. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.